Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Good morning. Hope you're doing well. I'd like to talk today about conflict resolution in distributed systems. That is, if several people change some data at the same time independently of each other, what happens? How do we resolve those conflicts that occur? Um, my background is I'm a researcher at the University of Cambridge. I was previously in industry in a bunch of internet startups, so I worked at LinkedIn for a couple of years, for example. Um, at the moment, I'm working on this research project called True Data, spelled T-R-V-E. And uh, what we're trying to do here is to bring end-to-end -end encryption to a larger range of applications. So think something like Google Docs, where several people can edit a document at the same time online, but without having to trust Google servers, because what we want to do is to be able to put data on various servers in the cloud but not have to worry about what happens if they get compromised or so on. So um, that's kind of the background of all of this. I'm not talking about the encryption and the security protocols today. I'm only focusing on one little piece of that whole project, which is what happens if several people edit data at the same time and how do we resolve that. So I'd like to start with a scenario that will probably be familiar with you, which is you, a little blue stick figure here, are hacking on some code on your computer. And at some point, you decide that this code is done, and you commit it using your favorite version control system. I'll just use Git as an example here. And so at this point, you put the code in the repository, and then maybe you push it somewhere so that other people can see that code as well. So in the case of Git, you, maybe you'll push it to a repository on GitHub. And this is now the communication mechanism for people with your team. Uh, so if there's somebody else, say this little red stick figure, who is also hacking on code, then, well, you can synchronize up through the central repository. This is all very familiar. This is what we do every day. And so the little red person here might independently at the same time also be working on the same code base and also do a commit. And now what happens if this person now fetches from GitHub? Well, they'll have to either do a merge or rebase if that's how your workflow goes or something along those lines. So in, somehow these changes are going to have to be combined together. And as you've probably experienced, uh, if people change different files in the same repository, that's no problem. They will just get merged cleanly. If one person changes the beginning of a file and another person changes the end of the file, that's probably OK because the version control system will merge them to automatically. If people change the same part of the same file, then you're going to have to resolve the merge conflict yourself. And so we have these tools for doing three-way merges, for copying patches from one side to another, and figuring out what the result should be. So you've probably had to fight with things like this. Uh, this is exactly the kind of problem that I'm talking about. But this problem happens not only in software development. It's a very general purpose problem. So imagine you're a lawyer working in a law firm, and maybe there's a contract being negotiated uh, with you've got a client on one side and the, other, and the other company's law firm on the other side, and everybody is sending these versions of contracts back and forth. And the contracts are probably Microsoft Word documents, because that's how lawyers work. And they send these things by email. And so you've got one person making changes to these Word documents, and then hit Save, and then and at the same time, maybe somebody else, maybe at a different company, is also updating the same document, changes it, and now you email these changes to each other. And so this is actually very much the same data flow, and I actually just reused exactly the same diagram and changed the labels. Uh, you've got the email as the communication path, and at some point, these changes are going to have to be merged together. And now for uh, Microsoft Word, I'm not sure there is even this kind of nice user interface for three-way merges. I know you can compare two documents, um, but I think what, you, what people then end up doing is manually copying the, the changes from one version of the document to another, and so performing this merge really manually. So that's kind of this oh crap situation here. So in this case, it's kind of best to have like an informal lock where one person says, OK, I'm going to be editing the document now. Please don't change it for the next day. I'll send it to you, and then you can edit it. So people try to sequence their updates like this through manual communication. What happens in another? Let's look at a third example. Let's look at a to-do list. 
And so this is maybe a shared to-do list where um, me and my wife together have this shopping list where I can add stuff and she can add stuff and then whoever next goes to the shop can buy those things. So here, um, buying milk is added to the to-do list. And let's say this to-do list is stored on a central server now, so that's what allows us to communicate. And so um, I, I add buy milk to the to-do list and press OK button. And so it does a request, like maybe an HTTP post request over the network to the server, stores it there, and comes back and says, OK, that was added to the to-do list. And at the same time, maybe my wife goes, oh, I need to water the plants, so I just remembered. So adds that to the to-do list, also does this post to the server, um, comes back OK. And so in this case, actually, what has happened is if this central uh, server stores its data in a database, and it uses something like transactions, if this is a relational database, say, then we actually have serialization going on. And that is, these updates are actually applied in a sequential order, in a serial order. That's where serializable comes from in database transactions, uh, which means they're applied one at a time. So you don't actually have the same concurrency problem as we had with the code editing and with the Word documents being sent back and forth, because actually, there's only one primary copy of the data, and that lives on the server, and that's being updated one transaction at a time in sequence. So in this case, you don't get this conflict resolution problem. So this seems nice, but on the other hand, you have a problem, which is, well, what if I don't have signal on my mobile phone right now? Or if the network is interrupted for some other reason, or I can press the button to save, and I'll just get a spinning, spinning uh, a weight indicator, and nothing will happen. So here we have this, uh, it's kind of obvious, this problem, if you don't have internet connection, then you can't reach the central <coughs> server, so you can't store any data. You can't edit the data in any way, so it doesn't work offline. So these are the problems here. We get the advantage from a central server that we don't have to worry about this concurrency and these, <coughs> these different edits happening at the same time and having to merge those together, but at the cost of it only works online. So we now require constant connectivity to the server, which is not so great, especially if you're doing things on mobile devices. Um, another problem is that these requests are synchronous. So when I press the Save button, I have to wait until I get the OK back from the server, and only then I know that it has actually been saved. So until I get the OK back, I don't know whether the network request actually made it through or not, uh, maybe if the network is unreliable. So that also can be a timing problem. Let's see in the document editing case. So say in the case of Google Docs, you know you can press one letter, and then a second later, that letter will appear on the screen of another person who's editing the same document. And so there, the, edit, uh, the unit of editing is a single keystroke. It's not even like a commit or something like that. It's just a single letter. And so in that case, if you wanted to send that through a central server, then every time you press a letter, you'd have to first send that to the server, wait for it to be saved there, wait for the server to come back to you, say OK, and then you could display the letter on the screen. And so you would have to wait for that network round trip for every single change to the document, um, which is actually what happens exactly if you're editing a file over SSH. So if you're logged into a Linux server and you're using Vim or Emacs or something uh, on the server and you type a letter, then that editor actually lives on the server, so you've actually got that synchronous round trip. So if, if you've got a slow or unreliable network and using SSH is pretty painful, as you've probably experienced. Um, a final problem with putting everything on a central server is that now there's this single point of failure, and people make fun of GitHub, for example. Every time GitHub goes down, people say, oh, we've got this nice decentralized version control system, and what do we do? We put everything back in a centralized service. Isn't that great? Uh, so, so this, this thing can be disrupted if you worry about denial of service attacks, for example, um, or if you worry about um, blocking, maybe in some countries that don't have such free internet access. If you're critical of the local regime or something like that, then actually this kind of uh, blockability is quite a problem. So what we'd like to do is to um, figure out how to not have these problems of the single central server, but at the same time, uh, not have all of the problems of having to do the merges by hand. So coming back to the to-do list example, if we think about this having to synchronously communicate with a server, that's okay if the server is in the same town, 
But if the server is on the other side of the planet, then this is quite slow because it's simply speed of light takes a while to go all the way around to the other side of the world and back again. So what if we just put data centers in several different places? So let's say when the blue person adds buy milk to the to-do list, that request just goes to the blue person's local data center, call it data center one, and get saved there. And when the red person adds water plants to the to-do list, then that goes to the local data center two. Those are two different local data centers if the people are um, in different locations. And so now that's OK. So each person can get a response from their local data center. And now these changes will be propagated asynchronously. And so the speed of light going all the way around the planet is still as slow as it was before. So it could happen that two people make these changes without knowing about each other. And then you simply don't know which one of these actually came first. Because you know, it's not really defined, did the blue one come first or the red one? From the point of view of data center one, first the blue one came and then the red one came in. But from the point of view of data center two, it was first the red one, then the blue one. So if this uh, adding an item to the to-do to to list means just appending it to the end of the list, then which order should these items appear? Now we suddenly have to worry about the fact that the data center one might have buying milk first and watering the plants second, and the other data center might have them flipped in the other order. Oh, dear. Let's think this further. Even without two data centers, we can just make it really extreme and say, OK, we're not even going to talk to a data center. We're just going to talk to our local storage on the device. And I'm going to treat the storage on my mobile phone as a data center. So it's the best data center ever, because I can't have a network interruption between me and the storage on my phone. So this communication is always going to work. So I can just store something locally, and that will be nice and fast. And the red user can similarly store something locally. And then we can just kind of have some kind of blah, blah network stuff to synchronize the, the changes around. And if you think about it, this is exactly the same as the synchronization process that has to happen with the, um, with the two data centers exchanging data. And it's exactly the same synchronization process that happened with the git commits being sent via GitHub or with the Word documents being sent by email. It's all exactly the same, which is you've got some changes that are happening concurrently, independently from each other, and those changes are being propagated asynchronously. And here, of course, now we're back to this problem of conflicts. So uh, take the example of adding two items to, to, do, to the to-do list. You can kind of imagine that's quite easy to resolve. You just make sure that you somehow decide on a consistent order, maybe using some IDs or something, or some U IDs. You can order them arbitrarily. But what if one item is, one, well, one change is de delete a to-do item, and the other actually edits that same to-do item. So the red one changes buying milk to buying soy milk, and the blue one just deletes the buying milk item. And these two changes happen without knowing about each other. So how do we resolve this? Because, well, if you say that the deletion wins, so, OK, this item was deleted, the to-do list item was deleted, so that edit to change buy milk to buy soil milk is just gone, because the item that it refers to is no longer there. But that means that we've forgotten about the fact that soy milk was uh, added in there. And so maybe that's an important fact that we've now lost. On the other hand, we could do it the other way around. We could say that this buying soy milk wins, but then the deletion has been lost, and so maybe the deletion is meaningful. So how do we resolve these kind of conflicts? In general, we have concurrent operations that happen. Concurrent doesn't mean necessarily at the same moment in time. It just means they happen without knowing about each other. And somehow we need to achieve convergence where everybody agrees on the same data at the end. And so people talk about eventual consistency, which is kind of the the database term that's often used for describing these types of system where you simply you can allow different things to happen concurrently and you just want to end up in the same state at the end. The problem with the term eventual consistency is that it's actually very vaguely defined. And so people are very imprecise when talking about it. And I'd like to break it down into three points, three properties that are a bit more precise. So I'm going to firstly assume eventual delivery, and that is we send messages over the network, and we're going to assume that the network is not interrupted forever. So we're going to assume that after some finite amount of time, 
you get a network connection again, and so you, if you keep retrying, then you can get the message through eventually. Um, you kind of have to make this assumption, because if you assume that a device can be offline forever, then it can never come in sync with the other devices again, just by definition of, on, of offline. So we're just going to assume that eventually some messages go through, but we're not going to make any assumptions about how quick that is. So if I go to Iceland and uh, there's no mobile signal and I'm hiking somewhere up on the top of a volcano for two weeks, then I won't get any messages for two weeks. And when I get back to Reykjavik, then I will get some messages uh, when I reach an internet connection again. Um, so that means my message delay is two weeks in that case. Um, that's okay, we're just going to assume that's all right. Secondly, the second part of eventual consistency is making sure that everybody ends up in the same state. That is, if we assume that eventually everybody gets all the messages, then if two people have received the same messages, then they should be in the same state. So that means that even if they receive the messages in a different order, they should still end up in the same state. And finally, what we want is to not lose data. Now this, um, it seems like a kind of slightly rid ridiculous point because of course nobody wants to lose data. Um, but it is actually quite important to make this explicit. So quite a few databases use uses this mode called last writer wins where you say if two people change the data at the same time, we're just going to pick one of them arbitrarily based on the timestamp as being the winner, and the other ones we're just going to throw away. And so this is like equivalent, if you think about the Word document example of, well, you've got two people editing the Word document, and one person emails their change to another, and the other person is just going to say, well, huh, I made changes myself as well, and I'm going to declare that my changes are newer than your changes, and so I'm just going to ignore your changes. Sorry. And so this is not very friendly to people uh, because changes get lost. So let's, let's require not losing data as well. So this is what I mean with eventual consistency, and this is the kind of data structure to which we might want to apply it. So I'm going to model this um, to-do list now as a JSON document, and you can just imagine it's like a, a list of to-do items, um, which is like each to-do item has a title and a flag done, whether it's done or not, true or false. And then maybe there's some settings and stuff as well on the side. And so the main data structures that we have here are an ordered list. That is, you've got a list of to-do items and they have to appear in a certain order. And the user specifies this order. And also you have maps, so you've got uh, maybe one JSON object inside another JSON object or something like that. Now, once we've got these data structures, we can then make various changes to them. So as the users interact with the application, they will make changes. For example, they might set watering plants to true. So they say, okay, this is now done. I'm going to check the box on my phone. And what that does is set this done flag from false to true. So the operation here, the change operation, the edit operation, is assigning a value to a particular field in this JSON document. Another thing that might happen is somebody might edit a string, so change, milk, uh, change by milk to by soy milk, so by inserting a, a few letters into that string. Another thing that might, people might do is insert a whole new list item of phone mum between by milk and before ordering watering plants. So this is editing the, the ordered list object to insert a new item. Another thing that people might do is uh, add another key to this map here. Or they might even delete an entire entry, so the top level to-do item. Just delete the entire list. Why not? Maybe you have several lists or something like that. So these are the kinds of changes that people can make to these documents. And what we want to do is have some way of resolving those changes. So that even if people make these changes concurrently to each other, we end up with eventual consistency. So we can model this document as a tree and we can have some data type annotations on it. So say the top level document is a map and inside it we have a list uh, under the key to do and so on. Won't go into too much detail. So this is actually an algorithm that I developed together with a colleague and we wrote this paper about a few months ago. So if you're interested in that, you can find it online. Um, it's called a conflict-free replicated JSON data type. It is, uh, has anyone here heard of CRDTs before? OK, a few people, cool. So this is an example of a CRDT. If you don't know what a CRDT is, don't worry. Uh, this uh, paper is very theoretical. It looks Inside, it looks kind of like this. So I'm not actually going to run through all of the operational semantics today, so don't worry about that. I'm just going to kind of give the intuition about how the algorithm works. And uh, 
just show kind of some of the curious edge cases that occur there, some of the stuff that we had to think about when trying to do this. But so the hope is that this algorithm would allow people to uh, concurrently edit JSON documents and merge those edits and end up with a sensible result at the end. So one example of a document, we sort of to-do list example, another one might be simply a text document. So it's a, a text document consists of the file name, which is just a string, um, it consists of the characters of the body, of, of the actual text, so each individual character is like the smallest unit you can edit, and like maybe there might be additional stuff for formatting, um, setting fonts and so on, I'm just going to leave all of that out. Another thing that's quite useful is cursor positions, so like if you use Google Docs, you can see where in the document another user is editing right now. That's quite handy to see so that you don't change the same place at the same time while you're online. And so you could Im imagine implementing that as a map from each client has a position. A position is like a, a location in the document, and so that would allow you to keep track of other people's cursors. So I'll just focus on the, the body characters for now. So the ordered list of characters is what constitutes the content of the document. You might wonder why this is, why this is a list of strings and not a list of characters. So begin footnote. Um, it's a list of, of strings because in Unicode, if you actually represent like one character, one, uh, the smallest editable unit of a document is not necessarily a single Unicode code point because you have things like combining, uh, combining marks, I think they're called, for accents and diacritics and various things, or for emoji, I think the skin color annotation is a um, combining mark. And so you end up with a sequence of several Unicode code points that constitutes then one character from the user's point of view. If you're interested in this, look at the Unicode annex number 29. Anyway, end of footnote, this is completely irrelevant. I just wanted to <laughs> mention that as well. Um, I'll give a little demo of the, the text editor we implemented uh, because it's just kind of fun to, to make this a bit more interactive. So uh, what I have here is um, something that doesn't work, hooray. Uh, sorry. This is always the thing with demos, isn't it? Maybe it wants to be on the Wi-Fi. Okay, let's try again. Okay, good. So, um, so this is a, a very basic text editor that we implemented uh, using this uh, data structure, this algorithm that we developed. And I've got actually two windows here, left and right, which are both instances of this text editor running. And I can say, uh, hello, go to Berlin. And, um, and it works. So you can see I can type something on one side, and it appears on the other side. And these two editors are actually communicating via a network connection. So they're two separate processes that are otherwise don't share anything. So they could easily be on two separate computers on other sides of the world, no problem. And uh, what I can now do is I can kill the server. So they, they use a WebSocket server here to communicate. And when I kill the server, what I'm simulating is a network interruption between the two. So now both editors are offline. Um, so this could be because actually it's a server outage or just because the clients have lost their internet connection. It doesn't really matter. And so I can keep editing offline. Um, so let's say here. So I'll say, hello, everyone at Go to Berlin. And you see it doesn't appear on the right-hand side because they're offline. Um, so we have these two now. And so I'm going to restart the server now. And what we want is for all of those changes to be preserved. So make sure, look out that everyone at is still there and hope you're all doing well is still there. So when I restart the server, the editors in the background keep uh, trying to reconnect to the server automatically and keep retrying in the background. And eventually, they will manage to connect and resynchronize. And now you see everyone at has been copied from the left to the right. And I uh, hope you're all doing well has been copied from the right to the left. And we didn't have any like uh, three-way merge user interface for this. Like It just did this automatically. Now, 
let's have a look at how this algorithm actually works, because um, that's kind of interesting. This is basically the same as what Google Docs does, right? So um, Google Docs is a bit fussy with its offline support, but if you force it into actually doing it, it essentially does the same kind of merge. And uh, I can run through a bit of how the algorithm in Google Docs works. So imagine you have a document consisting of the letters H, E, L, and O. And you label each letter with the index of what position it is, so 0, 1, 2, 3. And on the left-hand side, we've got the green editor. On the right-hand side, we've got the purple editor. And each editor now makes an edit to this. So the left-hand side inserts a second L character to change it to hello. And the right-hand side inserts an exclamation mark uh, at the end, making it H-E-L-O exclamation mark. And so now we want to merge these two changes that have happened concurrently. And so in order to do that, we have this server uh, to, this is in this case run by Google, and the clients send essentially a diff or like an operation uh, recording what the change, what change has been made by the uh, user and send that operation over to the server. And so the left-hand side says insert L at position three. So you see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so we inserted the L, so the O has moved from position three to position four. And so we inserted that L there. And on this side, we have the inserting exclamation mark at position four. And so that describes the change that was made. And now the server forwards those changes over to the other client. And so the green change, inserting the L, gets forwarded by the server over here. Insert L at position three. Position three is the right position here. So you end up with hello exclamation mark, which is what we wanted. However, if you think about what happens in the other direction, so this insert exclamation mark at position four. If we simply send that through unchanged, what we will get is hell exclamation mark O. Because over here, we inserted the uh, letter L at position three. So the O moved along from three to four. So really, we would need to change that to insert exclamation mark at position five. And only then we would get the right outcome of having hello exclamation mark. And so what has to happen here is that this position four needs to be changed to position five because there was concurrently an insert at position three. So the server has to keep track of all of these different things going on simultaneously, and it has to transform the messages, rewriting this three to four. Some of the transformation happens on the clients as well, but this algorithm does actually depend on the server to do some work as well. And that works. So this algorithm is called operational transformation. And it's been around for quite a while. So it was first discussed in the academic literature back in the 1980s, um, although the first uh, paper that presented this algorithm was actually incorrect. And they said so in the paper. They said, here's a case in which our algorithm fails. Uh, can help someone help us fix it, please? And then several people, researchers, came along and proposed fixes to it, which worked. And there are several different competing algorithms there. The one that most of the modern operational transformation based systems are kind of inherit from is called Jupyter from 1995. And that's what like Google Docs and Etherpad uh, is based off and Google Wave, which is now Apache Wave. Um, they all use this Jupyter design, which is to use the central server that does some of the transformations. Uh, some of the others don't use the central server, but instead keep track of some kind of multi-dimensional hypercubes of all of the edits happening simultaneously. They start requiring quite a lot of memory, some of those algorithms which is why they're not used as often in practice. And so this kind of works fine for Google's purposes. But remember, what we wanted is to be able to work with end-to-end -end encryption. And so in that case, we can't have a server transforming our messages, because the server would then have to see the content of the messages. And we want, what we want is, well, we want to avoid one central server, because that's a single point of failure. And we want to avoid that server seeing the content of our messages. So we want to be able to just forward the messages. And this is where CRDTs come in. So um, CRDT stands for commutative, uh, no, sorry, conflict-free replicated data types, which is a bit of a mouthful, which is why people just say CRDTs. Um, and essentially, this is a family of data structures where several nodes can concurrently change the data, and they can automatically merge. And so they've got, as part of the definition of the data structure, they've got merge functions or functions which allow you to apply operations in a different order and still get the same outcome at the end. And uh, 
if we want to model something like a text document, uh, like what I had in our editor example, in that case, we have um, an ordered list of characters. And so the data type we want here is an ordered list. And several different algorithms were, have been proposed to that. They're, they're more recent, only about in the last 10 years, these things have come up. And the one that I'll describe now and that our text editor is based off is called RGA, Replicated Growable Array, which came out of a Korean research group in uh, 2011. So let me show you how this one works in a nutshell. We start off with the same example document, which is H-E-L-O. But now, instead of giving each letter just an index, 0, 1, 2, 3, I'm going to give each a unique identifier. Each letter has a unique identifier, which might be just 0, A, 1, A, 2, A, 3, A. And we now have the same edits happen. So on the left-hand side, we insert the letter L. And on the right-hand side, we insert the exclamation mark. And every time we insert a new letter, we have to make up a new identifier for that letter. And we're going to have a little rule for how we create new identifiers. So we have them to, they have to be globally unique. Um, and they also have to have a certain ordering property. And so we're going to construct them as follows. Each identifier is a number and a letter. And for the number, we choose one greater than the highest number we have so far in the document. And so the document so far contains 0 to 3 as numbers. So the next number we're going to pick is 4. And then we call the left-hand one is node A, the right-hand one is node B, and so that will be the letter that we use for the identifier. And so if we assume that the names of the nodes are unique, so there's no other node called A, there's only one node called A, and uh, furthermore, we assume that these numbers are generated by taking one plus the highest we have, so the numbers per node will always be unique. So that means we generate 4A on the left-hand side and 4B on the right-hand side. So it's the same 4 because they're both in the same starting position, um, but they have two different node IDs, so we get two different identifiers. And so that works. And now we can send these things via a server, or it doesn't even have to be a server. This goes via P2P network or anything else you like as well. So I'll just use a server here for simplicity. And instead of inserting at a particular position, we're now going to say insert L, and we're going to say the ID of the new, of the new letter, which is 4A, and we're going to say where to insert it by saying after position 2a. And so 2a is the first L. And so the new L with 4a gets inserted after 2a. And on the other side, we insert the exclamation mark after, four, uh, after 3a. 3a is the letter O. And so inserting the exclamation mark with ID 4b after 3a means put the exclamation mark after the O. And so we can now forward these messages. So insert L with 4a after 2a. 2a here still means the first L, so it's going to put the second L in the right place and give it the uh, ID 4A. And on the other side, we can take this message and apply that, insert exclamation mark after 3A. 3A is still the letter O. Even though we inserted the letter L before it, it hasn't changed the fact that the ID of the letter O is still 3A. And so we can put the exclamation mark with 4B after the letter O, after, four, after 3A. And so we end up with the same document in both places, which is very nice. We can now just have some kind of network between these two. It doesn't have to transform the messages in any way. It just needs to make sure that it keeps retrying and eventually the messages get through. That's all we need here. We can encrypt them and it's all very nice. Now there's still a problem with this algorithm, which I wonder if anyone can spot. Yes? Deletion. Uh, deletion is one thing, yes. I, deletion is actually quite easy. So what we do for deletion is just to set a flag for every ID and say that if it's deleted, then the ID actually remains there, secretly, hidden. Um, but we're just going to say, OK, this O is gone now, so uh, don't show it in the user interface. Um, we, that's called a tombstone. There's another. Same position. same position, exactly. So what if two people insert at the same position? So let's uh, have a simpler example document here. ABC with IDs 1A, 2A, 3A. And now let's say x and y get inserted here between a and b. So the left-hand side inserts x and y, gives them two new IDs according to the rule that I specified earlier, so 4a and 5a. And, and so what that means here is insert x after 1a, insert y after 4a. And on the other side, on the right-hand side, I'm going to insert p and q. 
And we'll have the same rule again for assigning IDs. So they get 4B and 5B as their IDs. And they also appear between A and B. And now we need to make sure that all of these letters end up in some kind of consistent order on both nodes afterwards. And so let's take those operations and apply them to the other side. So insert P with the new ID 4B after 1A. 1A is the first letter A, so we insert P there. And then insert Q with, letter, uh, with, with ID 5B after 4B. 4B was the letter Q, which we've already inserted. So we can put the Q, uh, it was the letter P. 4B was the P. So the Q with 5B goes after the 4B, so we put A, P, Q, X, Y, B, uh, B, C. So now, OK, that's fine so far. Now we need to make sure that on the other side, we're actually going to end up with the same thing. So we need to make sure that the X ends up here after the P, Q, but before the B. Because if we put the X here, then the two would be inconsistent. So, well, how do we do this now? Because the message is going to be the same. The message is just going to be insert x with id 4a after 1a. But if we put it straight after 1a, then the x will go here, and we have an inconsistency. So I'm going to introduce a small algorithm which uses these IDs. And that is, look at the ID of the incoming operation here. When you're applying an operation that came in from a different node, in this case, that's 4a. So 4a is the incoming operation. And we first find the position after which we want to insert. So 1a is here. So we start here after the a. And we look at the next, the ID of the next element in that list, which is 4b. And if that ID here, 4b, is greater than the incoming element ID, 4a, then we're going to skip over it. And if it's greater, the next one is greater again, we'll again skip over that. And we keep skipping until we find an element that is less than the ID of the incoming operation. So 2a is less than 4a. So in this ordering here, we look at first the number, then the letter. So here, 4b is greater than 4a because b is greater than a. 5b is definitely greater than 4a because 5 is greater than 4. But 2 is less than 4, so we know now we have to insert between the 5b and the 2a. Ooh, and then for the final operation, it's actually easy. So this insert y with ID 5A after 4A. Well, 4A is here, so 5A just goes after it, and that works. And if you're wondering, the skipping here doesn't apply on this side, because here the 4B is greater than 4A. So when we inserted uh, this 4B here, we didn't skip over 4A, because 4B is greater than 4A. And so this actually works. And you kind of have to actually prove it mathematically to convince yourself this really works in, in all cases. But we have proved it, and so we actually believe this. And so, hurrah, we now have an algorithm which will allow us to make these changes concurrently without any transformation, without any coordination, and just allow us to end up in the same place. So let's say our document is, hey, guys, and we decide that that is not general, gender neutral enough, so one person is going to change it to, hey, everyone, and the other person is going to change it to, hey, folks. And what does our editor do in this case now? So I described just now how deletion works. And so deletion just means setting a flag on these. So if two people concurrently delete the same letter, they both delete the G of guys, well, that deleting it once is the same as deleting it twice. It doesn't get any more deleted through being deleted several times. So um, those letters just get deleted, and the insertions stay, because one insertion doesn't replace another insertion. So as these two merge, what you're going to end up with with is the two insertions concatenated. So it'll be, hey, everyone, folks. Or maybe it'll be, hey, folks, everyone. So the order of those two is arbitrary. Um, that just depends on coincidence of how the networking happens to work out. Um, and you know, there's no order that is any, one order isn't any better than the other. The problem is just that what we have here, everyone, folks, is not an English word. And so you kind of end up with junk in the document. Though this is actually what Google Docs does as well. So at this point, I'm willing to just say, OK, we'll tell the users that, look here, this doesn't pass the spell checker. And it's maybe we can pop up a warning saying, hey, several people edited the document in the same place. But actually, Google Docs doesn't even do this warning. It just leaves humans to spot it by themselves. And it seems to work in practice. So I think at this point, we just say, OK, it's good enough. We're not going to try to do a grammatical analysis of the sentences and do the merges automatically so that they obey English grammar, because that's just 
not going to work, actually. People have tried that, and it simply didn't work. So um, we've got this uh, CRDT, this data structure for ordered lists, which several people can change at the same time. Um, described deletion and how that works. There's still a lot of open questions there. So the problem with deletion here is uh, we need to actually remember for a long time afterwards where a particular ID is, because we use these IDs as a position in the list, like an address, like a pointer. And so we can't just delete. If something gets deleted from the document, we can't then just remove it and forget about it entirely, because then some operation would come in and insert after 503A, and we go 503A, sorry, that was deleted. I don't know where to put that insertion. So we have to keep those things, which are called tombstones. Also, I haven't talked about how to do undo, uh, like you know, Control-Z type undo or how to reorder the elements in the list, that's kind of interesting, or how to make all of these IDs efficient so it doesn't take too much storage. So still a lot of open questions there. I think the basic algorithm is kind of fine, but actually putting it into practice is still going to need a bit of work. But I want to talk about some other stuff as well, actually. So we were talking about these JSON documents earlier, and so interesting things happen when several people can currently change JSON documents that don't happen just in the case of a text document. So let's say we've got here, it's a bit of a contrived example, I'm afraid, a map of colors. And so this is, imagine this is an actual structure, so it's not like curly brace, quotation mark, C, O, et cetera, as a text document, but it's actually the, the JSON syntax tree described here. And so one person inserts a new color, the color red, into this map, and so you then end up with a map containing blue and red. And another person concurrently decides actually they want to wipe out the entire contents of the map, so sets it to the empty map, and then adds green into the map. And so how do we now merge these concurrent changes that have happened here? What happens? What's the outcome? What, what is even the right behavior here? What, what do we expect? So we can think about it systematically and say, well, OK, Blue, does it contain blue? Well, blue was deleted on the right-hand side by setting the whole map to empty. So I guess blue should not be uh, in the final result because it was deleted and the left-hand side didn't touch it. What about red? Red initially didn't exist, but it was inserted on the, right, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side didn't touch red, so I guess we need red to be in the final result. What about green? Green was inserted on the right-hand side and it was not touched on the left-hand side, so yes, we want green to be in the final result. So our final expected outcome is that it should contain red and green, but not blue. Does that seem logical? I guess so. So we can do that, and our algorithm does this. What this means here is that we have to keep track of what this setting the map to empty means. Because if you just take this and say um, on the left-hand client, you first add the red in, and then you take that change that came from the right-hand side, which is setting the map to empty, and if you just apply that naively and say you've got an operation that is set map to empty, well, then you're going to wipe out the red, because the red was added concurrently. So we have to somehow remember what the state of the map was at the time when you set it to empty. So we have here, this thing is, is known as a causal context or something like that. In databases like React, for example, has anyone used React? The, they have this data types feature? OK. Um, it works very similarly to this, that you have this little extra bit of information that you pass around in an HTTP header. And that, the purpose of that is to keep track of what is the state, what was the state uh, of the document at the time when you saw it, so that then later you know what the changes need to apply to. <coughs> so let's look at a different example. Here we've got, again, an our to-do list example, and we've got buying milk, and it is not yet done. And so on the left-hand side, an edit happens, and it just deletes buying milk from the list, because maybe it's been done, or maybe we no, lo no longer need milk, or whatever. It's just removed from the list. On the right-hand side, somebody sets done to true. So taps the button to set buying milk done to true. What happens if we try to merge these two different updates? We can apply the same logic as we had just now with the colors, with the nested maps. So with the colors, what we said is, OK, does it contain each of the different things depending on who edited what? OK, so the title of buying milk, on the left-hand side, that was deleted because we deleted the entire to-do item. 
So I guess the title should not be in the result. On the right-hand side, we didn't touch the title, so that's got to be deleted. What about done false? Well, done false was um, deleted on the left-hand side and overwritten on the right-hand side with done true. So I guess done false is out. What about done true? Done true did not appear on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, done true was added, so we want done true to be in, in the end result. So if we apply exactly the same reasoning logic, what we end up with is a to-do item that came, contains the flag done true, but no title. And this is kind of not what you expect, because like, we've applied exactly the same logic, but what we've ended up with something is that looks weird. Um, and it looks weird because we kind of have this implicit schema here. We expect a to-do item to always have a title and a done field, but this uh, merge here has essentially tampered with our schema. So what do we do here? Maybe we need a schema to explicitly say exactly what fields something must have, but in that case, what do we do? So if somebody changes, if one person changes a field within an object that has a schema and another person deletes that entire object, well, do we say the d deletion wins? So in that case, any changes to stuff within the deleted item are just going to be lost. But we said earlier we don't want to lose data. So how do we resolve this? Or maybe we say, actually, the, if somebody concurrently changes this and sets done to true, then we're actually going to bring the title back as well. So even though the title was actually deleted on the left-hand side, we kind of resurrect this whole deleted item and say, OK, it's going to ba have both a title and done true. Uh, but then, well, we forgot about the fact that somebody deleted this item. So it seems like something has got to give here, and we don't really know what it is. We could say that maybe overwriting something with an empty map should not have the same semantics as deleting it and then re-adding it again. Or maybe it should have the same semantics. So I'm afraid this is going to end on a slightly depressing note, which is like we simply don't know how to expose these kind of concurrently editable data structures to application in a way that is not horrendously confusing. And so I think, that's, I think there's a lot of value in having these kind of data structures that you can just merge automatically and not have to worry about writing manual conflict resolution code. Um, but at the same time, concurrency still is hard. Even if you abstract away the concurrent communication and everything, you've still got the problem that somehow you can sometimes end up in these merge situations where there's no one right way of doing it. And so if any of you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, otherwise, we're continuing to work on this and just try different approaches, see what kind of APIs make sense to developers. We could go back to the old bad days and say, OK, we're just going to have this, this oh crap scenario. We're just going to let users resolve all of the edits manually. I don't think that's really friendly to users. And so I think the, like the popularity of things like Google Docs and indeed like uh, Meld or things like that for conflict resolution in Git shows that like, actually people do need a bit of tooling and help in order to, uh, in order to resolve conflicts. We could say, OK, we'll just put everything on a central server and serialize everything. That's an option too, but again, we've got this problem that you require network communication all the time and it stuff doesn't work offline, which is also a shame. So I think it is worth working on this problem, um, but it is an open problem. If you're interested in more details on this, um, I've put, tweeted the slides already, so you can find it there, and there are links to all of the papers. Uh, here's a second page, and here is a third page of references. Um, so our paper is one of those in there. There are also several others about different CRDTs and different operational transformation functions. Um, so that, that goes into vast amounts of detail. Here is a book that I've been writing, which I just sent off to the publishers uh, just two days ago. So you can get an early release of this online already. This is it's not specifically about merging. It's very broad kind of introduction to the architecture of databases and what do databases do under the hood also. So, if you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, I'd love if you can check it out. Um, maybe give me any feedback if you have any thoughts about it. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much all for coming, and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Do we have a minute or two for questions? I'm a bit short of time. We do? We do? Okay, does anyone have any questions or comments or anything? We have some on the app.
said, the first one is a very long question. That's all right. So the question is, apart, apart from the operational transformation algorithm, is there any algorithm which uses weighted operators to decide the last operation? For instance, the delete operation has the lowest impact for that loses. Are there, in terms of weights, maybe <coughs> neural network prob probabilities making decision faster? Um, so you can use weighting, except that doesn't fundamentally resolve the problem, um, which is that you can end up then in, in some kind of scenarios where you've just got an impasse and you've got two things with the same weighting and one of them has got to win. And so you can then arbitrarily decide whether one thing should win over another. And so that's what I was getting at with um, kind of these uh, trade-offs here of like, you could specify maybe in a schema some kind of semantic annotation saying we want delete to win or we want update to win. The problem there is that it's really hard, I think, to communicate that to developers of like, what does that actually mean? If you don't have a PhD in distributed systems, will you still be able to understand what this flag in your schema actually means? So I think just making stuff comprehensible in a way that like somebody can just go and build an app and they don't have to know about all of the internal details of how conflicts are resolved internally, I think, would be very good. Um, and so maybe priorities is one way of doing that, but I'm not sure. The other question just there was, uh, how did I make my slides, uh, which is using an iPad. I, I draw them by hand uh, using an iPad app called Paper by a company called 53. I think we should wrap up. Okay, thank you very much for coming.